you see from our bulletin today, we're going to be speaking about stewardship. And, you know, Scripture tells us that the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. Um, we know that, we acknowledge that, we understand that, but at the same time, we still have sometimes a knee-jerk reaction when somebody starts talking about money. Sometimes it's more our reaction than it is our action. I heard a, about a, a grandpa who, uh, he had played the 29-cent lottery for years. Now, if you don't know what that means, that means every time he got a publisher's clearinghouse, he sent it back. Now, he went ahead and ordered some magazines once in a while, and he did all the things that you're supposed to do if you're working through the mail. Okay, just put that plug in. But uh, he played the sweepstakes all the time. He was playing, and he never really expected to win. It was just one of those things. Well, time finally came when Grandpa won the sweepstakes. And the family found out before, before Grandpa did because Grandpa was getting up in years, and he had a weak heart, and he had won $500,000. Now, you can imagine they were a little bit worried about telling Grandpa because that would be kind of a thing to spring on somebody, especially if he's got a weak heart. And so they thought, how can we tell Grandpa? We don't want this to kill him. And so <clears throat> they said, we'll, we'll call the preacher. He's got kind of a way with words. Maybe he can ease into it with Grandpa. They've been buddies for years. Let's just get the preacher over here. We'll tell the preacher. He can tell Grandpa. So the preacher came over. And he and Grandpa were sitting out on the front porch rocking, and, and Grandma brought them an iced tea and a lemonade, and they were just sitting out there, and they talked about one thing and another. Finally, the preacher started to ease into it, and he said, well, Grandpa, see, everybody called him Grandpa. He said, Grandpa, you know, I was just wondering, <clears throat> what would you do if you had $500,000 free and clear? I mean, I'm, I'm talking about Grandpa, if you had a half a million dollars, what would you do with it? And Grandpa said, oh, that's easy, preacher. I'd just give it all to the church. And the preacher fell over dead. <laughs> now that's just a joke. And I let, waited till the children were gone before I told it. But you understand, sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes stewardship is one of those things you almost have to ease into. And so as we ease into it this morning, I want you to know that first of all, let's take a, a moment to define what we're talking about. Stewardship is the godly use and management of someone else's goods or money. Stewardship, for us as Christians, is the godly use and management of all that the Lord has entrusted to us, whether it be our, our time, whether it be the abilities that we have that we can invest in the lives of others, whether it be the wisdom that we have. And by the way, many of you have a stewardship of wisdom that you're, you're, you're up in years now and you think, well, I can't do an awful lot, but you can sure pass down that wisdom. It's a stewardship of that wisdom. Some of us have the stewardship of talents that we need to be putting to work, maybe in the work world, maybe in the world of the church, but then also so yes, we are going to talk about the stewardship of our money. So the question comes up, and it's the name of the sermon this morning, who cares about stewardship? Who really cares? Does it matter all that much? And I'm here to tell you this morning that it really does matter. God cares about your stewardship. But let me tell you also that the devil cares about your stewardship. Your church family cares about your stewardship, and you and I should care about our own stewardship. So I want you to open your Bibles with me this morning. We'll start off in that classic verse in, in Malachi chapter number 3. Malachi chapter 3. We're going to end up in the book of Romans, but right now let's look at Malachi chapter 3. Zerbeth's got it on the screen up here, so if you don't want to look it up, it's there. But in your own Bible, sometimes it's best to see it in your Bible because I didn't make this up. This isn't Robert's word. This is God's word. And what God's word says in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 is this. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And Test me now in this. Let me just stop for a moment and tell you, this is the one place in Scripture where God says, test me. See if I won't keep my word. I'm promising you this. You try to outgive me, is basically what he's saying. Test me and see if I won't do what I'm about to say. As he says there, test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. In other words, God will give you back so much blessing, you won't have room to receive it. that will be just flowing out all over the place. That's the promise of God. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, 
I want to say, and I want to start off with these four points very quickly. God cares about stewardship, and we're talking about giving, we're talking about tithing, but we're also talking about whatever other resources the Lord may have put at your disposal. Giving, stewardship, tithing, being faithful with your resources was in place before the law. I hear people all the time, well, that's just legalism, that's just the law, that's tithing business, that's just the law. Listen, they were tithing before the law. They tithed and gave and had stewardship of their resources all through the law, and then they tithed and gave and had stewardship of resources after the law. God has forever connected our management of the small things of this world, and by the way, money is one of the small things, the resources that he puts in our, at our disposal could be considered one of the small things. God has connected our management of the small things of this world with how, we, how he blesses us. The way we steward these earthly things determines how much God can entrust to us in other things, in more important things. Like a little boy, you might be able to connect with this idea. You can imagine a little boy who one morning for Christmas, he gets up and there in front of the Christmas tree is a train set. And it's a train set that, I mean, he's been, he's been looking through the window because he wants this train set. He's been wanting it a long time. And it comes with like 200 pieces of track and a nice little train. And, oh, he's wanted this train set for a long time. And daddy gives him the train set, but the daddy is a wise daddy and he knows what's going to happen. If he gives him that whole train set at once, it's going to be in 27 different places. It's going to be underfoot. So this is what the daddy does. He gives him the train and a, a, just enough track to go right around in a little circle. And he says to him, now, son, you see, you've got that much track. When I can trust you with a little bit more track, I'll give you some more track. And when the boy proves that he can make the train go around, toot, toot, and he doesn't track, you know, knock it off the track, it doesn't fall into a floor... It, you know how sometimes they see how fast they can get the train running? And just see, oh, look at that, was a great wreck. Yeah, it was a great wreck. That's not what you want to hear. When you try to entrust your child with a, an expensive piece of equipment like a train set, you don't want to hear, look at that, it's burning, Dad, look, it's burning. You don't want to hear that. <laughs> That's bad. So what he wants to do is he wants to make sure that little boy can run his train right around the track. And when he gets that where he knows he can trust that little boy with that much track, then you know what he'll do? Then he'll give him a little bit more track. When he begins to see in that little boy the responsible behavior, good decision-making process, then that wise dad will give that little boy a little bit more track. God has done the same thing for us. I hope you can see that kind of an illustration at least, that God has given you already all the track you can handle. And he's really given you as much track as you have demonstrated that you're able to handle by the decisions you're making and the responsibility that you've shown with the, the stewardships that you've already been given. So God cares about your stewardship because he has forever connected his blessings with your stewardship. Secondly, the devil cares about your stewardship. Because the devil, he knows the stewardship principle better than you do. But let's, if we backtrack just a little bit in Malachi chapter 3 there, I want to read Malachi chapter 3 verses 6 through 9 to you. Because in Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, God says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. When you reread that, you understand that the people of God had been put under a curse. See, the devil knows the stewardship principle better than we do. He knows that if he, he can absolutely choke off God's blessings from the people of God if he can get us to misuse the blessings that God has already given us. If he can get us to use our time in a way that's not glorifying to God, we are misusing our time. If he can get us to use our talents in a way that doesn't serve the kingdom and glorify God, he can get us to misuse our talents. If he can get us to misuse our treasure, that is our money, in a way that does not glorify God, in a way that just satisfies us, what's that really doing? What that really is is we are abusing a stewardship and the devil knows if I'm abusing my stewardship, the devil's laughing. 
Because, in fact, the devil laughs while we do without because the devil knows if he can get us to spend God's money, spend God's tithe on something else instead of the, the giving back to the Lord, he makes thieves of us. Isn't that what the scripture says right here? Now, once again, this is not the book of Robert. This is the book of Malachi or Malachi, however you want to pronounce it. But Malachi was preaching to his people, and they were keeping and holding back God's tithe, the thing that, God, that belonged to God. And, and, and he said there in verse 9, you are cursed with a curse. The devil knows that if he can make thieves of us, he can put us under a curse. But actually, it's not the devil doing it. It's we ourselves when we withhold that which belongs to God. So the devil cares about our stewardship. But let me give you a third one. For this one, we're going to need to turn over to Romans chapter 12. If you don't mind turning in your Bible with me to Romans chapter 12. We've been talking for several weeks, really, out of Romans chapter 12 because we've been talking about what it looks like to be a normal Christian, what it looks like to be a maturing, growing, normal follower of Christ. And in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, we're going to find out that your church family cares about your stewardship. The, the stewardship that you display, the stewardship that you live, your church family, that group of believers to which God has added to you, added you to, them as well, they care about stewardship. The reason that your church family cares is because they belong to you and you belong to them. Let me read verses 4 and 5. This is Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. But just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. You see, we belong to one another. They belong to you, you belong to them. This is my hand, right? You would agree with that? It's connected to my body. This is my hand, and this is my eye, all right? Now, <clears throat> when they work together, my hand and my eye can reach out and pick up a pen. This one happens to say Carhartt on it. Just happens. Through total random, it just, that's what it says. Okay, when, I do, when they work together, I can pick up, a, I can catch a ball, when they work together really well, they can reach out and pick up a Snickers bar, open it up, and put it right in my mouth, and it all works together. So the hand belongs to the eye. The eye belongs to the hand. Together, they work correctly. That's another reason why the Scripture says when one part of the body is honored, the whole body is honored. And in one, when one part of the body suffers, the entire body suffers. And by the way, you think, well, that's not really real. I mean, that's, that's just one of those things that's in the Scripture. I, I, I can prove this illustration when it talks about the body and all the different parts belonging to one another. Because you do belong to your hand, and your hand does belong to you. If you don't think so, just hit that thumb with a hammer. You hit that thumb with a hammer, and you know what will happen? Your feet will begin to dance. Your eyes will begin to water. Your mouth may begin to mutter things you shouldn't say. All because you hit that thumb. Now what in the world's my thumb got to do with my feet dancing and my eyes watering? My thumb, my eyes, it's all connected together. Every member God has added to the local body of believers, God put there for a purpose. Every one that God has worshiping in a local body of believers has a reason for being there. God put that person into the body to be a functioning part of that local body. And when we do not fulfill our stewardship in that body, we are actually, well, whether it's in serving or in giving or whatever else, we damage the body to which we belong. And, and I, we've talked about this several times as we've done the Lord's Supper. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians that when you, they came together, some of them were, were sinning and some of them were bringing their sin to church with them. And because they weren't correctly able to discern the body of Christ. Some of them were sickly, and many of them slept. Many of them had already died because they had not correctly discerned the body of Christ, correctly caring for one another. When we are not serving one another the way we should, somebody's being hurt. When one part of my body is not doing the part that it's supposed to do, some other part of my body is being hurt. And there is an old saying that you probably... It goes like this... <clears throat> Everybody who belongs to the body of Christ belongs to everybody who belongs to the body of Christ. Now say that three times fast. 
Everybody who belongs to the body of Christ belongs to everybody that belongs to the body of Christ. That means you belong to me and I belong to you. We need each other. So God cares about your stewardship. The devil cares about your stewardship. The rest of the church family cares about your stewardship, but you should also care about your stewardship. That's why we go on in Romans chapter 8, or excuse me, Romans chapter 12 here in verse 6, where it says, And since we... Each member have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let each exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. See, I, I, I have to say, as I read this, I need to realize this and, and, and keep this in the front of my mind as much as anybody else, do, anybody else does. And that is, as these stewardships are, are presented here, whether it's the giving, whether it's the serving, whether it's the exhortation, whether it's the teaching, I need to remember that only that which is sown will ever grow. Only that which I have sown can be reaped. Only that which we have faithfully planted can we hope to ever receive a crop from. I can't receive a reward if I don't plant something. Stewardship, planting and reaping, is a lifestyle of the normal follower of Christ. Joe Average, Joe Average church member, Joe Average follower, you know what? Average guy, he has to be talked into giving. Average gal, she has to be talked into serving. Average gal or guy, they have to be talked into encouraging. The normal Christian will realize all we have is a stewardship and react accordingly. And you, somebody says, well, but Brother Robert, my little dab is not going to mean that much. Well, my little ability, my little thing, my little part that I can give, how much difference will that really make? I mean, how much? It's just a little bit. When you start wondering if your little bit doesn't mean very much, I want you to spend some time thinking about an oak tree. Because every time you look at an oak tree, what you are seeing there is a testimony of what can happen when one little nut will not give up. When one little acorn takes a hold and won't turn loose, you get an oak tree. And oak trees don't grow overnight. Sometimes it takes some time. God has forever linked our blessings to our obedient stewardship. The devil knows it and wants to stop it. Because it stops the blessing. The church suffers when we don't fulfill our stewardship. And when we don't play our part, we miss out on God's blessings. We miss out on the fulfillment that we are supposed to have. Now, I said all that to start with because I wanted you to be inoculated, if you will, to that knee-jerk reaction that so many people have when a preacher starts to preach about money. Because I know that that's the thing that so often is the slander. Well, all they want is your money. That's the average slander that comes for any church that preaches tithing or giving. But because we're looking at the signs of what normal Christian life is, to be a normal follower of Christ, it's important how we give will demonstrate whether or not we are a normal follower of Christ, whether it's our time, our talents, or our treasure. The time that we've given is precious. Listen, you're not going to get any of that back. If you invest that in the body of Christ, you invest that in the people around you, you invest that in your family, that is a good investment. As we have our talents, the abilities and gifts that we share with others to serve others, and our treasure, yes, the money that God's given to us. How we give will reveal much about our spiritual health. And, and just as we have here in Romans 12, it's, if you read it, go all the way to the very end of the chapter, which I won't do this morning, there's a wonderful list of all the normal Christian virtues, the things normal Christians show, the things normal Christians do, and it's not even an exhaustive list. But the thing is, a lot of these virtues, as we read about them, they're a little bit hard to quantify. They're maybe a little hard to demonstrate. Maybe a, difficult to prove, because I wonder sometimes when I, I was talking to my, in my Sunday school class this morning, I said, you know, I just don't know how much mercy I really have. I wonder, am I really being merciful? Because there's no mercy meter somewhere. You know, I don't get to talk to somebody and then look under my coat and say, ooh, look at the mercy meter today, I'm really high. It's just not there, or, or I don't really sometimes know if I'm really pursuing peace with someone. Sometimes I think maybe I'm just poking the bear on purpose, but maybe I'm pursuing peace. It's hard to tell because there's no peace pressure cuff that I can check. The only thing, in fact, there is one, there is one though here that one, God's given us a way to check, and we can look at it, and it is so easily assessed, it's so easily demonstrated, the one thing God ever challenged us to put him to the test to is written about twice in Romans chapter 12. It's in Romans 12, 8 there where it says, 
He who sows, what, what is it? He, he, he who gives with liberality. He who gives with liberality. Another verse or another word for that is generosity or generously. Another word for that is simplicity. Just give with simplicity. Give with generosity. Give with liberality. And then verse 13, it says again, contributing to the needs of the saints. When you see a need, contribute toward that. The reason those are in there again and again and again is because it cuts right to the heart of us all. Because God knows that our hearts love money. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, the Scripture says. And Jesus taught that you cannot serve both God and mammon. But Jesus taught a lot about money and giving and stewardship. 38 parables in the Word of God. 16 of them have to do with giving or stewardship. Almost half of the stories Jesus told had to do with stewardship and giving. You know, you think about love. Love is a pretty important thing in the New Testament. It's all over the place. In fact, there's over 500, 500 just a few plus, 500 verses talk about love. Love one another, love God, love others. It's there. Five, that's a lot. You'd think, wow, that's a bunch. You know how many are about giving, tithing, stewardship? 2,000. 2,000 of them in the Scripture. So if we're going to faithfully teach and preach God's Word, we're going to have to talk about stewardship. We're going to have to talk about giving. We're going to have to talk about money. So how can we assess our stewardship? How can we tell? You know, maybe you've heard the old saw, the old saying that says, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? How would you like to be on trial for that? How would you like to see that in your own life? Would there be enough evidence to convict? We could look at each one of these virtues and try to figure it out. But according to Romans, here in verse 8, again in verse 13, some are hard to quantify. Giving's not so much. I wonder how long has it been, Derek, since you've looked at your bank statement? You have a, a wonderfully competent wife. She's a, a banking person. She does. See, I don't have to look at mine either. Some of you do. Men, if you're doing that, great. God bless you. Some of us have a wife that does that for us. Some of us do it for ourselves. That's fine. Whatever and however it works. But I wonder how long has it been since you looked at your bank statement because I am 100% sure that we can assess your level of spiritual maturity by looking at your bank statement. Now, I'm not going to look at yours, and you're not about to get to look at mine, okay? Because you'll see how many times Brahms and Walmart's on there, and we're not going to talk about that. But let's just say we're looking at our checkbook, all right? And here, or maybe you've got your online statement, there it is, and it says Brahms, Walmart, gas station, electric company, you got Mazio's, you got First Baptist Church Coal, you've got, okay, first, there it was, First Baptist Church Coal. Look at how often and how regularly those giving moments are on there. Now, some of you don't give by check, some of you give by just cash, but maybe, I'm telling you, you can look at your check, but you can look at your giving pattern, you can tell your maturity, you can tell your level of growth with the Lord. And when it says give with simplicity or generosity, liberality, that means just not being stingy, okay? Not being quick to check that the church is buying the cheapest kind of toilet paper. Because I don't care about that. Giving through God's church to God. See, that's the other thing. We're not giving to this church. When we put, and by the way, I want you to remember, I preached this message after we took the offering. Okay? When you put money in that offering plate, you're not giving to this church. You're giving to God through this church. It's not the church's money, it's God's money. When you give to a ministry of other kinds, uh, whether it be a, a teaching ministry or a, a missionary ministry, when you give, you're giving to God through that ministry. Now, will you get taken advantage of? Yeah, probably. But see, I'm giving by faith. It's up to God to deal with them after I give by faith. I may never get a thank you letter. I may never see the return on investment that people are always so concerned about. I don't know if I'm going to get the bang for the buck that I thought I was going to give when I give. Because it is possible that I was taken for a ride. So do I stop giving? No. No, I never stop giving. Because if I hear God say, give, I want to give. And by the way, there's a verse in Proverbs that says, he who gives to the poor, lendeth to the Lord, and God will repay him again. That's a pretty good verse. Even the Jida, he heard it. He who gives to the poor, lendeth to the Lord, and God will repay him again. How would you like for God to owe you money? Give to the poor. The Bible says you're lending to God. 
and he will make sure you get it back. Maybe in money, maybe in that which money cannot buy, but that's, that's Proverbs 19, 17 if you want to look it up. It's in your own Bible. Take a look. And friend, if I really do belong to Jesus, you know what that means? All the time that he has given me, the stewardship of time that he has given me, he, it's his to do with as he pleases. If I really do belong to Jesus. If I really do belong to Jesus, that is, I have been bought with a price and I am not my own, then my talents and my abilities, they belong to him and he can use them as he sees fit. If I really do belong to Jesus, then my treasure, that is my money, it comes from God. Do you, do you, have you ever read uh, uh, Deuteronomy 8.18 that says it is the Lord that gives you the power to get wealth, the one that gave you the intelligence to get that good job, the one that gives you the strength in your body and the air in your lungs? That's God. He's the one that gives you the power to get wealth. So if he's giving you the wealth and you belong to Jesus, my money's from him, it really all belongs to him. And the one to whom I belong is to tell me what I do with it. We are stewards. That is, we are managers, if, if you'd like that word better, of what in actuality is really his to command. All of it. Now, <clears throat> somebody might be thinking right now, I don't know, but I, I just, I'm from the same state y'all are. That's why I'm comfortable saying y'all from the pulpit. But I know somebody right there might be thinking, Brother Robert, you stepped over the line. Giving is not required to go to heaven. I cannot give and still be saved, Brother Robert. You need to back up. In fact, the dying thief never gave a thin dime, and he made it, Brother Robert. Maybe you better just back up a minute. Well, if that's you thinking that, you need to buckle your seatbelt and strap on your steel-toed shoes because it's going to get worse. The dying thief didn't have to. The dying thief was not able to give because he was dying. You are living. That means if you're not giving, it means that you are a living thief. Ouch. Malachi, I wish you hadn't said that. But Malachi did say that. If you're stealing God's tithe money and spending it on something else, that means you're a living thief. There are people all over this country today that drove to church in stolen cars because they're using God's tithe money to pay for the payments on that car. <whistles> now, your stewardship is between you and the Lord whether it's your time, your talent, or your treasure, whether it's the minutes that he gives you, the motivations that you have, or the money that you bring to the offering. Now, I hope you won't get mad at me, because what I have preached this morning is not from me, it's not of me, it is God's truth. But I'm here to tell you, stewardship is the pathway to God's blessing. You see, stewardship is like the little boy that I talked about. It's like the guy with the, the, the track. God gives you a stewardship. You Take good care of it. You take care of that responsibility. You know what God will do? He'll give you more to be a good steward with. And as you're a good steward with that, He'll take you from that level. You'll get more. And as you're a good steward with that, He'll give you... You want to be in charge of more for the kingdom of God? Steward what you have now. Manage what you have now. Take good care of what you have now. People who are, are always saying, God bless me, God bless me, God bless me. Remember the little boy with the train track. Take care of the track you've got, and God will give you a little bit more.